Okay, so um, first of all, just a quick sort of introduction. Greg and I became co-editors of the journal in this past winter, January-ish, February. We um, became the editors. The founding editor of the journal is Bill Blair from Penn State, and uh, the journal is coming up on its 10th anniversary. So in the world of scholarly journals, that's actually a pretty new journal. Um, the journal's mandate is it's called the Journal of the Civil War Era, which is a significant title and one we've given quite a lot of thought to. Uh, Bill Blair, as the founding editor, described the journal as covering, uh, broadly reconsidering the era of the this American Civil War. How you define that era is up for some um, discussion. It's not immediately obvious, but we think of our main area of focus as the mid 19th century, um, before, during, and after the Civil War, with some kind of chronological outliers, particularly on the um, more recent history side in terms of uh, dealing with things like Civil War memory, uh, later kind of iterations of you know what does the Civil War become and Reconstruction become um, in American history after that. And in addition to the kind of chronological parameters of the journal, we also think about the journal um, broadly in terms of topical fields. So although you know the obvious things that the journal would be covering would have to do directly with the Civil War, um, you know everything ranging and anything that might have gone on in the years 1861 to 1865 that had to do with the war itself, whether it's military history, the home front, um, political developments. But it, beyond that, right, the, the study of the Civil War has never, of course, been uh, merely the Civil War years itself. Um, but topics related to um, the origins of the Civil War, what happens after the Civil War. So all of that stuff related to the war. But in addition, um, areas of focus that haven't traditionally been uh, narrowly conceived Civil War topics. And we are particularly interested in publishing work on um, African American history and Native American history and thinking about the ways that those areas of history and historiography intersect with more conventionally defined topics in the Civil War era. And there are a lot of other permutations that we can also discuss about the ways um, that we see the journal, but we are really um, you know, interested in just about every possible kind of way you can think about this uh, really fundamentally important mid 19th century era of American history. And so I think that, you know, some of the questions that people asked had to do with, um, you know, if I do this slice of things or that slice of things, if I work on one region or if I work on the Mexican American war, what, what questions like that, like would that, would you consider that to be a topic for this journal? And the answer is going to depend, it's going to vary. It has a lot to do with how you pitch your article, um, but it also, in, to some extent, will have to do with can you can you show its overall significance or relevance for the Civil War era, right? So, so um, I would say, you know, just generally speaking, there's nothing that you should think of as being off limits or off of our agenda. Um, but it, but sometimes we might ask people to make a case for why this is an article that our general readers would be interested in and would benefit from reading. So that's just, um, that addresses a few of the questions that you all asked, but also kind of gives you a sense of, to some extent, our vision for the journal and um, which we see as just continuing from um, the kind of founding vision articulated by Bill Blair. Greg, you wanna to add to that? Yeah, just briefly. Uh, that was great, Kate. And I do think it's a source of some mystification. Um, simultaneously, we get, you know, people who inside the field, you know, sometimes assume the journal's not interested in, uh, say, Civil War specific topics. Um, that we're all about the era, uh, you know, and then from outside of the field, I think many people who work in 19th century, especially on topics that are more cultural and so on, assume that we're only interested uh, in the war. Uh, and neither of those assumptions is, uh, is, is correct. Um, you know, from the day that the journal was started, just to sort of highlight what Kate said about this not being solely of, uh, you know, we're not trying to pat ourselves on the back, but from it was when it was started, it was started specifically because of concerns that other journals were too narrow and that we needed a journal that, as Bill Blair wrote in the first issue, um, covered the many subfields that animate 19th century history, creating a place where they can engage with each other. And that just reinforces Kate's point. That is being able to show that uh, not just that you're working in your own interesting corner, but that you can use that in order to cast new light upon a range of other things that people who are broad-minded and broadly interested can do. So as Kate said, we've had lots 
of efforts and including a special issue coming up on connecting with Western history, with Native American history. We've been working toward expanding our reach back into uh, slavery and not tying solely to uh, the narrow, you know, leading up to the Civil War. And obviously both of us are scholars of Reconstruction and we've uh, had worked before about expanding the journal's reach into the 1870s. Where exactly the dividing line between us and, say, Jagaith at the later end, or us and the Journal of the Early American Republic at the earlier end? I think everybody on all the journals would agree that those are, are, are not hard and fixed places, and that there are things at the later end that could work in either journal, and things in the 1830s and 1840s that could probably work with either us or, or JEAL. Do you want to pose a question, one of the questions for us, Cecily, or should we kind of uh, cover a couple of the thematic pieces? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, one thing people are really interested in is how do you decide on a thematic issue? And then how does, you know, a guest editor get selected and then pieces get selected versus um, kind of what themes are, are you guys, you know, interested in and, and maybe thinking about? Yeah. So this, a lot of times, um, we, uh, in the practice has been uh, that people pitch the idea of a thematic issue um, to the editor. Sometimes the editors in the past have sought input from editorial board members or others just to try and assess, um, does this, you know, sort of fit a need? Is there enough interesting, engaging work in the area? Is it going to likely to attract and also make a case uh, for itself or why it deserves this kind of attention, um, which is the, often the sort of challenge of writing the introduction uh, to these, uh, to these uh, uh, edited by, to these special issues. And so, um, you know, often they have come in that way. In fact, when Kate and I did one before we were editors, we pitched it to, to Bill Blair um, and it ended up running uh, while Judy was, was editor. Um, you know, and an awareness then of what are some of the other special issues. We try not to run more than one a year so that we retain space to publish a good number of the incoming articles over the transom, which to me are still the kind of lifeblood of the, of the journal, you know, to have this, uh, you know, uninvited note from the wilderness and to, and to read it and say, this is really exciting and people need to read this and we also can help this person sharpen this argument. So that's the, the balancing uh, point there. Uh, running them at the right time, but not running them so much that we lose our ability to have space for uh, for brand new articles. Kate, do you have things you want to add? Um, not, uh, that, not really, except that um, usually what happens in those is that somebody will pitch. There's not, somebody had asked a question like, can you submit to a special issue? Usually somebody will pitch a special issue and then that person will develop the roster of people who are going to write articles for it. So they're more like solicited articles as opposed to having an open call for papers. Um, that's just the way it's typically been done in the past. Um, you know, that way there's more control over, the editors have more control over, let's say you want to get, uh, you know, so for example, the special issue on abolitionism, you want to get a variety of different angles on the question of what does abolitionism look like or what are new directions in the field, you might prefer to invite people to be part of that as opposed to just seeing what comes in if you do a call for paper. So we can, there are good reasons to go either way with that, but traditionally in this journal, it's not, it's been the, um, the special issue editor who's kind of selects those. And again, and just to reiterate, there's a balance between doing special issues, which, uh, you know, can be really informative, can really put a certain issue out on the table in a very clear way that is really helpful for people to sort of think through a historical question or problem. But at the same time, at all of the space that those take up, in a, we publish quarterly. So you have one full issue devoted to a special issue that's that many fewer slots for things that are coming in over the transom. So we want to do them. We, we actually think they're terrific, but we don't want to do too many because it takes away from our ability to just publish what, you know, what everybody's working on and wants to see in print. I, I, uh, I think another big question folks had, and, you know, we have a good mix here of early career versus graduate students. A lot of the, what people are thinking about and maybe being told is that they either need to publish a chapter from their dissertation or they need to spin off an article from their first book manuscript. How did the editors kind of encourage people to you know, size that up or down? How much of the argument from the dissertation should there be? How much should it be a discrete article? And what's the best practice when you're thinking about something from a larger project to an article? Um, okay, well, first of all, just to be clear, and this, this addresses something that was raised a few times, when an article comes in, 
um, the editors look at it and sort of decide whether it reaches the bar to be, it, to, for it to make sense for it to go out to readers. And it either then at that point, you'll either get a note saying, we don't think this is suitable for the journal, or we don't think this is ready to go out to readers, or we'll, you'll receive a note saying this is going to go out to readers. When we make that assessment, we're not thinking about, is this a chapter of your dissertation? Is this a chapter of your book? Is it a spinoff? We're just looking at the article on its own terms and assessing, is this, does this have the potential to be a publishable article in our journal? Um, so likewise, so this just goes with the question, we're not interested, we don't pay any attention to like, do you have a PhD or not? Are you an independent scholar or not? Are you working as a historian or not? Are you a lawyer? Like we don't, none of that actually factors into any of the decisions we make. We just look at the article itself and decide whether we think it should go forward and in what way. Um, so I think the question of, you know, should you publish a chapter of your dissertation and things like that, I just want to first of all say that for those of you who are graduate students and early career, you know, recently out of graduate school, I would say that these are not questions, these are more questions that you'd want to discuss with your advisors um, or mentors because I think reasonable people can disagree on this question. There are a lot of different views on this question. And it's in some ways, it's just not a, I, I advise grad students, so I can talk about what I say to my grad students, but it's not a question that we really deal with as editors of the journal. We just look at what you send in and decide whether we think we want to publish it or you know, whether to go out to readers. Um, so you know, how you slice and dice your work as the junior scholar is something you should really get advice on from people you trust and care about. And you may get a range of different views on that topic. And if you want, I can say what I think about it, but uh, you know, that's just sort of where we stand in terms of the journal. Greg, do you want to add to that? I, I think that's right, that you want me in, and then eventually your editor, right? Because some book editors have strong feelings about what exactly they want published before. But that's, we, you know, in our role as, as editors of the journal, um, that's not a, a consideration for us. Uh, you know, I think there is a general rule of thumb people talk about, about not publishing more than two pieces from your dissertation. Um, I don't know that every press literally follows exactly that, but that's that's often something that that is said. Um, but it doesn't doesn't affect us. And I would just reiterate um, because it was a question that came up, and I don't want it to slip by. Several people ask questions about status, um, and as Kate said, um, I can honestly say. Um, that your status uh, doesn't really matter. We have rejected full professors, you know, not sent them to readers. Uh, we have, you know, sent things immediately from, you know, very, very, you know, from very junior people uh, still in grad school and so on. Um, and your affiliation is not really the, uh, is, is not the, the point. Often I don't even, even look because we want to be giving our first look blank, though, though it is visible to us as editors. Um, you know, that it just it really doesn't matter that we're looking, you know, we can talk about and, and I know there are a bunch of questions on this and, and, and we can come to that as a separate question what we are looking for. But I can assure you that that status is not uh, what we're looking for. It does more for the journal to publish things that are exciting and fresh than to sort of have a name, whatever that means. Um, you know, people are looking for content, not just not not the name. And uh, that's what we're reading for. So it really doesn't matter if you have an affiliation, your degree. There may be aspects, obviously, about having gone through grad school that help you to figure out how to pitch something historiographically. Um, but the affiliation itself is not a, not a limiting factor. I think an, another question that kind of arises from this, a lot of folks asked about how much of the article should be historiography. How much should you be talking about kind of the, the bibliographical kind of intervention that you're making? Or, um, you know, what's the way one person has to make a good first impression with readers? I mean, what's, you know, stylistically, what does a Journal of the Civil War uh, era article look like and, and sound and what, and what does it kind of try to do? So I think there's, um, you know, there's obviously uh, more than one model that's out there if you read through us and other places and there is room for experimentation, but I do think that many of them basically have a, have a format um, where after a, you know, opening that's meant to gather people's attention, whether through an anecdote or a broad and clear statement, um, that there is often this sort of wrestling with uh, historiography. 
Um, and, uh, you know, I think um, in Kate and I prepping, I think the number she suggested was somewhere around, you know, uh, four pages or so, um, you know, which is not a hard and fast rule. I know it's like one of these things we were wrestling with is you give a caveat and say it's not a rule and that's the part people remember. But you need enough to show people that you have, one, really wrestled with it, because that's the first thing that readers will notice, and two, that wrestling with it, you have something interesting to say. Um, but it can't be so much if you're on page 10 and still in historiography, unless it's a historiographic essay, um, then you know, the question of what you're delivering is gonna be confusing to people. So it is possible that you're entering a historiography carefully and clearly enough to find that you could do it slightly less than four pages. Um, and, um, but, but somewhere in that, in that three to four pages is what many of the articles fall into, to how to really show this development, and then also make sure that the heart of the article is the delivering upon the promise you made in your, in your opening. Um, what do you think, uh, Kate, do you, what do you want to add to that? Yeah, so, um, <clears throat> yeah, so just to sort of clarify, so the, your argument should be clear to us by the end of page four is the kind of rule that will then complicate and say, okay, not always the end of page four, but somewhere in the first four or five pages, we need to see, you need to move from, you know, usually I feel like this is a total cliche, but you know, some sort of opening anecdote to your argument, to how it is going to change how we think about this or that. And when you say the significance, what, but when historians say, what is the significance of their finding? what they are almost always doing is putting it in relation to the literature, right? So when we say this, you know, you have to answer the so what question, right? You have to tell us why does this matter? You found a really interesting set of things to research, some interesting corner of, you know, the Civil War era that nobody has really looked at before. Okay, great. Show us why it matters. Show us why it changes how we think about things. And how do you do that? Well, you have to tell us, well, how do we already think about this? And that is where the historiography comes in. Um, and I think that one of the things that we sometimes see, and this is a complicated issue, but we sometimes see articles that sort of say, you know, nobody's really written about this before. And like, this is the great untold story of such and such when the truth is a lot of people have written about it before. And this is a, generally speaking, many areas of this field are very well tilled soil. People have been writing about some of the things that we write about for 150 years. Um, and so rather than, we, I, we don't really want to see, and it's gonna really get called out in peer review, over claiming, over statement of the novelty of your argument, over statement of your claims. And so rather than trying to swing for the fences without um, crediting the people who have addressed this question before, or the people who have written on this topic before, the better strategy is to deal very with very honestly and very um, as as kind of uh, completely as you can with the existing literature. And I want to just qualify completely because sometimes completely is totally impossible, right? I mean, there's like you know a million articles on this, that, and the other thing. So let me just sort of say not complete, complete, but you at least have to deal with the um, major works in your field, right? And kind of explain. And, and again, if this goes to peer review and people say, yeah, well, they're forgetting, you know, Potter or what, you know, like they're, they're forgetting this major thing or they're, or they're mischaracterizing an argument, that is going to make a very negative impression, right? So whatever you're saying at the outset of your article has to be the most honest characterization of the literature that you're addressing that you can make. Um, because if you kind of don't do that, you're not, your readers are going to feel kind of annoyed. Um, and that sometimes involves thinking about, actually, just to kind of continue on this for a minute, thinking about who might be invited to read your article. Our peer review is anonymous, but you might think like, well, gee, you know, what if, you know, I'm really engaging with um, federal emancipation policy during the Civil War? I wonder if they might send this article to Jim Oakes for review. So if you're saying, you know, Jim Oakes never wrote about this, but actually he really did, that's going to be a pretty big problem when it goes out for peer review. So, you know, think about some of those potential readers that actually the people whose work you might be accidentally mischaracterizing or forgetting to write about might actually be the people that are being asked to uh, review your article and write your article as if they're part of your audience. Um, yeah, so those are, those are some of the 
I think, you know, both the combination of not being clear about what your argument is and then sort of not being clear about what is the historiography that you're engaging with are, are two of the pitfalls that we see with articles that are submitted that are generally, you know, fine, but that aren't gonna, that don't show us like what you're really trying to do and why it matters. That's great. And Cecily, I wonder one thing that we both touched on and that's another theme in going through the many excellent questions that you all asked and that we're trying to cover before taking additional questions um, today. But another one is, uh, is the process. And I wonder if um, it makes sense for us to try and make sure that you all, that we do the best that we can at explaining literally uh, what happens. And I wonder if, because I know people, uh, you know, will, will want to know uh, your sense also from the inside. Uh, some of the pieces might have changed a little bit, but if you might actually start out and talk a little bit about what you experienced as the process as the editorial assistant and what surprised you, and then Kate and I will talk about how we're running it now. Is that sure. all right? Yeah, sure. Um... You know, again, like I said, I, I, you know, I'm a student of, of Bill Blair's and, uh, you know, even though I worked with Judy Giesberg as editor, Bill is the kind of um, person who established the way that I learned to assess and review a manuscript. So again, when it comes in to begin with, um, the editors acknowledge it and then they send it to the editorial assistant, um, who's usually a post comps PhD student uh, from Penn State. So someone who's done a field in either 19th century U.S. history, or maybe more specifically in the Civil War era. Um, and then, you know, we, at least when I was the editorial assistant, I used the rubric um, argument contribution method recommendation. So the first thing I would assess an article for is the argument. What is, or what do I get the sense that the author's trying to say? So it's ideal if that's a one or two sentence clear statement. That's the, you know, the best thing it can be. Um, if it's, kind of unclear or nebulous, it's going to be a lot harder for the editorial assistant to articulate that argument. Then the contribution, um, what does it add to the literature? And what does it genuinely add? Um, the editorial assistant will be saying in their review, um, you know, this, this, this book already does this, and this article or this person has discussed this topic, what is new? What is the contribution? And then methodology is, what new sources are, are they bringing to the table? Um, what new perspectives? So is that Civil War in the West, Native American, African American? Um, you know, what is the methodology that's being employed? Is it an economic history? Is it, is it quantitative, qualitative? Um, is it literary analysis? Um, and then the recommendation. And that's where the editorial assistant says, you know, their reading of it is, yes, it's a significant contribution. And they would say to the editors, uh, we'd like to send it out. And here are some suggested readers. The editors make the final call in any case, but the editorial assistant will also kind of come up with a list of the, the suggested readers um, for the article. And then if the editors do decide to send the piece out, the editorial assistant then contacts um, those readers, or now there's a whole system for it, right? I used to have to do this by email. It's now online. Right. Okay. Well, that's unfair. <laughs> Um, so the editorial assistant uh, sort of manages the readers and the readers reports come in and you know what is often you know surprising there is how wide the range of feedback can be from readers. Um, so the editorial assistant will collect those and just basically notify the editors that the reports have come in and that's when the editors kind of go back to their initial assessment of the article and then take the set, the you know, the set of three opinions and try and parse that for you as the author and say, here are the things we really agree with. Like these are the top tier things that this article needs to do if it's a revisory submit. You know, then on down to you know smaller quibbles, which they're always going to be. I think the most surprising thing to me, and the thing a lot of folks had questions about was how do you deal with a reader's report? Because it, it does have kind of these multiple levels of the biggest problem versus these are really small things that would take, you know, ages and ages to change, um, but uh, are they are they important? Um, so maybe that's a good, you know, good place to spin off. But that's, you know, essentially the process. And like we said, two months is really our kind of um, goal is to have it completely turned around with readers reports in two months. But, um, you know, sometimes it occurs faster and sometimes it can take six months if, if a reader gets away and you have to find a replacement. So you know, be in contact with the editors um, and the editorial assistant who will be in contact with you. But, you know, patience is much appreciated, I think, on the editorial side. Yeah. 
So no, that's great. And we'll come back to what to do with the reader's reports, which is another question that, that surfaced in, the, in a few of the pre-submitted ones. Um, yeah, but you know, just very quickly, that's basically we have some difference in functionality. And as uh, Cecily said, we have a, a new system for managing, which seems to be making things much more um, easier on the uh, grad assistant and also visible for the, for the rest of us, which is good. But essentially it comes in that, you know, uh, right up by the grad assistant, um, Kate and I uh, sometimes weighing in by managing director and managing editor, and then uh, Kate and I read over and make that first assessment. Out to readers, rejected, um, or sometimes um, we're not ready to send this out, but if you can do this, uh, you know, then we, if we believe it will be ready to send out. Picking the, the readers, which we try and maintain a broad pool, so we're not always going back to the same well, both because we don't want to exhaust people and we do want to uh, keep building the voices that are uh, speaking into the journal at that phase. Um, you know, uh, usually three, occasionally two, if, uh, you know, if there are reasons for that. The letter out with your uh, revisions, what happens after that? Uh, so skipping over the, the key and thorny question of how to respond to the reader's report. When you send back your, um, your revised version, generally you want to send a good cover letter that explains the revisions that you made, as well as assesses uh, revisions that you, uh, you know, made decisions not to, not to take on, um, and tries to respond to the letter that the editor sent you. At that point, there's a couple of possibilities, one of which is that you've uh, done all those things and, uh, and it moves into the publication uh, area, and then it becomes really the, once that decision's been made, it becomes kind of more the hands of the managing editor who walks through copy editing and those kind of things. Um, sometimes we ask for one of the reviewers or occasionally even an additional reviewer to read the revision um, to get another set of eyes on whether this significant thing has been, been assessed, uh, has been achieved or not. And then that goes back and there's another round that varies a lot uh, journal by journal. I think there were seven rounds for me at the AHR. Um, and uh, there are a few journals that famously have many, many rounds. That would be highly unusual to JCWE. Um, uh, you know, process. Um, how long that takes really depends, uh, you know, on what comes out of it, right? If you send a draft that's polished enough that it's ready to be sent out, if we find editors, we make that first decision, should it go out or not in two weeks, uh, barring true catastrophe, right? So we don't want you sitting around waiting for a long time to see, is my manuscript just sitting there on a desk? In two weeks, we'll tell you it's out to readers or it's not. Uh, and then it's back in your hands and you can, you know, are free to do what you want with it. Um, you know, if, if the editor, if the readers respond in six to eight weeks, we usually try and get our letter back to you within a week or so of when we've got those responses. And then, you know, so that process could go as quickly as, you know, 10 to 12 weeks. Um, there's often, you know, slips and, you know, sort of a little padding along the way. And it really then depends how long the revision process takes. Um, once something goes from being from that process to accepted, it can actually move relatively quick. We try not to keep a huge backlog. We don't want to be a journal where you're accepted and then it's like it'll come out in two years uh, because I know that's frustrating, especially for people early on. Um, and uh, we do have a significant copy editing process, so there still is some time that's involved in that. But from that acceptance until when you come out, it might be something like nine months or so by the time it goes through just as a ballpark. Sometimes a year, sometimes slightly less, depending on the way that the issues are timed. Kate, what do you want to add to that? I don't think I really have anything to add to that. I mean, a couple of people asked about multiple submissions or sort of like, okay, how committed am I to, to you if I send in an article? And, and the answer to that is certainly the practice is that you, you should not have the same article under review at more than one journal at a time. So that's why one of the reasons that we want to get back to you really quickly about whether we're sending your article out or not. Because if we're not sending it out, you deserve to know that so you can go ahead and try it with another journal if you want. Um, if we are sending it out, then there's a kind of implicit agreement that you're not going to send it to another journal while it's under consideration at our journal. And you can understand there are a variety of reasons for that. One of which is, you know, when we send a, an article out, we're asking other, you know, this goes to sort of what peer review really is. We're asking our peers 
to spend time with your article, evaluating it. Um, they, nobody gets paid to do these peer reviews, right? So we consider this to be just part of your professional responsibility. Um, and we don't want, this is not a market kind of transaction, right? So we're not, we're not pitting them against some other journal that you're also courting an exclusive relationship until you hear back from us, at which point you can th then again do what you want. If we say revise and resubmit and, and our revisions are just kind of overwhelming to you and you can then say, you know, I'll, I'll take this on board, I'll make some changes, but I'm going to submit it to a different journal at this point, right? I don't think this journal is ever going to really be the place for mine, my article. That being said, I mean, that's a judgment call as well, because if you submit to a new journal at that point, you're going to have to begin the peer review process anew. Right. So whereas if you resubmit to the place you originally submitted it, there's a you're already established. You don't have to go through that initial round of peer review. So there's judgments to be made. At, but if when your article is under review with with us or with any other journal, you're, you're obligated to, to not be sending it out to multiple places at once. Um, yeah, so maybe we can talk about um, the question of how to deal with feedback and kind of deal with those reviews that you get back. I'll say, I'll just say a little bit about that. So it's certainly true that you will get two to three readers reports that may be conflicting with each other. Um, they may be of varying degrees of attentiveness. Some are very long. I think we say we'd like them to be one to two pages or do we say two to three? Whatever the case, some people really go over the top. So some people will send an incredibly detailed report and then line edits. Other people will send, you know, a paragraph and we don't really have any control over that. And we generally speaking, will just send you what we get back. Um, and they, again, and we, and, and since you're going to see the peer reviewers reports, you, it's like raw material, right? So you can actually see, okay, this person's telling me to do one thing. This person's telling me to do another. You're not going to know who they are. So it's very, can be very weird and unsettling experience. And part of the job of the editor of the journal, or editors in our case, is to guide you through those reports with our cover letter that we give you. So we will be writing you a cover letter that explains what we make of the reader's reports and what we think is important in them. And so, you know, we may say we want you, we think that reader A is making an especially good point about what the shortcomings in this article are. And you know, we might say something like, well, we think reader C is interesting, but we're not sure you need to prioritize those comments. <laughs> um, and we might mention places where the readers are, have a consensus, right? So you may see a lot of disagreement among the readers, but we might point out, you know, all the readers are telling you this, right? So, and when you then are processing what you're getting back, the editor's letter sh should be really important to you because it's, it's giving you guidelines it's giving you a sort of hierarchy of concerns you know if you're thinking oh this one person asked you know why don't you tell me more about you know the pomegranate trade because that was really important too but the editors didn't really mention anything about the pomegranate trade you know you probably don't have to look into that so um and so i think you know just as a general practice getting peer review comments back can be depressing and overwhelming um obviously you probably wouldn't have sent your article off if you did not think it was ready to be published um, or you didn't think it was pretty good and you're subjecting it to the review of people who also have no particular investment in you as a person they're invested in the field they're invested in scholarship but they they don't care one way about you personally um, and so there are some pieces of advice that i've gotten over the years about sort of how to deal with getting that feedback back um, and one is just to kind of read it over once and then set it aside for a little while, right? Don't just agonize about it. Don't, you know, don't decide that you're never going to make it in this field because you just read these readers reports and whatever, right? Like read it, go for a walk, put it aside for a week, you know, but by the way, I've neglected to say like almost every, nobody really gets their articles accepted on the first round. I mean, there's virtually no, you know, articles that get submitted where it's like, yeah, run this, right? Like, so almost everyone gets a revised release of that. And there's always people are going to quibble with you about this or that, right? So, you know, that, so just a revise and resubmit as opposed to a rejection is a win. That's thing number one. And also, whatever happens with your article, you, you hopefully the advice you get when you get the feedback 
you can put it to use, right? So if your feelings are hurt at first or you feel wounded, you know, later on, hopefully you'll be able to look at it and say, you know, this actually could help me make my work stronger. I might not actually be ready to publish this article, but I can integrate these suggestions into whatever else my book manuscript, et cetera. So the other thing that's really helpful and interesting to do is show your, show the entire thing, your article and the peer reviews and the editor's letter to um, a colleague, somebody who's a more senior in the field, and just say, hey, like, could you look at this, please? What do you make of this? What should I do? You know, um, because somebody else's eyes on it can be really helpful as well. We even had a colleague of mine um, workshopped a thing like that, where she had gotten a revise and resubmit from the JAH. And with a group of faculty and grad students, she gave us the article and the peer reviews and the editor's letter and said, you guys help me think through how to do this really major revision that I need to do. And it was really interesting. And I think it also modeled, she was a faculty colleague who had tenure at the time, but it really modeled that, you know, we all grapple with this. This is not just a thing that you grapple with when you're just starting out. Like we all get these things back and feel flummoxed or feel overwhelmed and or even feel hurt or insulted. And so um, to be able to share that and solicit people's feedback and advice about how to move forward can be actually really helpful and is there's no absolutely no shame in doing that. Um, so those are my comments, Greg. Yeah, no, I, I'll, I'll just pull out and just for reemphasis, uh, you know, a couple of things that you said clearly. A, it is a win if you get to revise and resubmit, right? We reject articles all the time, both initially not sending to readers and after readers. Um, we virtually never, uh, you know, uh, say, you know, this is, this is ready as is. We might all carry around our kind of hope when we send it out for that. Um, but that just really is not the case uh, with, with, with anybody. Um, you know, even when you're talking about the most established scholars and a special issue that's got all these, you know, things worked out, there's always, uh, you know, a request for revision, virtually always request for revision. A second thing, uh, so A, treat that as a win and take the time that you need to treat it as a win, right? You know, that you don't want to either overreact to it or you don't. Sometimes you see people get it and they're like, I'll make all these changes this weekend. And then we're like, oh, actually, what we suggested involves some rethinking, right? I admit, admire the, you know, energy, but it's probably going to take you a little longer to, to work with it. And that's okay. The thing you'd like to avoid, I, I, I one time was talking to a, a bigger journal, uh, you know, a, a sort of a you know, discipline covering journal. And I said, what percent of your revise and resubmits never come back? More than 50%. Uh, some journals, I think it's far more than 50%, that the people get it and disappear. And then I said, well, what percent of those were you hoping would never come back? And he said, almost none. If we don't want somebody to come back, we'll tell them, you know? It's, it's not out of kindness to you that we give a revise and resubmit. If we're not gonna publish it, the kind act to you is to say, it's not working for us, good luck somewhere else. And if you publish it somewhere else, mazel tov, that's good. And we're happy about that, that's no, uh, you know. So if we're sending you that, we're telling you, you know, we would like to see this again. And uh, it is surprising the number of people, I know things come up and stuff, um, but who at that point um, fall off the radar. And I do think that's a place where a kind of dogged perseverance um, through the revisions, uh, you know, even if it takes a couple of rounds, um, is something that you really do see rewarded. Um, so those are the only pieces I, I would, would add to that. It's not a checklist, right? Like we make the decisions. And sometimes I think when people see the reader's reports, that they kind of feel like it's a, it's a sort of grading rubric. Um, but it's rare, if somebody says something that we think is totally off base, we'll try and note that in the letter. Um, or occasionally letter, you know, reviews say things that turn out to not be applicable. We got a review that noted that one person, one article, uh, you know, tended to draw heavily on the work of one person and they wanted to make sure that that person was suitably credited. The author of that article was that person, uh, which shows the blind review process works. Uh, you know, we put in the letter, you don't have to worry about asking yourself if you feel credited, right? Um, you know, so it's not a checklist, but if something's really off, we'll tell you. Um, but we do expect you to really think through and take seriously the things that, that you say, that they say, and to have a real reason uh, for what you do and for what you don't do. So, go ahead, Kate, 
or Cecily, either one. No, I was going to say, I think we've covered actually a lot of the big themes yeah. that were, Cecily, are there things that we should cover that were kind of brought up or? You know, I don't, I think, um, you know, there were some questions about format and bibliography. A lot of that's on the website. So just, you know, do, um, you know, use the website. It's, it's kept updated and, and uh, it has the, you know, the basic things about word count, you know, um, and bibliography and citations and uh, how to remove your name from the document, which we'll have to do if you don't, but that's not a big deal. Um, and no, I didn't think there was any other, you know, major questions from the sheet. Um, well, we have, I mean, we have, I was thinking we could do this for about an hour, right? So it's a nice round number. So why don't we take some questions? Uh, you know, we have some time to just take questions from the people who are here. Cecily, you, you can describe the process. Cecily, that you want people to be recognized or? Yeah. So the, the chat function is not enabled at the moment. So I think <laughs> what I'd ask folks to do is use the um, reactions to just put a little hand up or a thumbs up if you have a question and I'll try to write your name down if you do. Um, and, and then, you know, we'll just kind of go in that order. So if anyone, you know, wants so to. If you haven't been teaching on Zoom or taking classes on Zoom, so you, you go to participants at the bottom and it will open up the participants. And then at the bottom of that, you should see an, a little icon that says raise hand. So if you have a question, you just click on that and then we'll be able to see that you're raising your hand. Cecily, why don't you call on people? Yeah, I, have, I don't see one yet, but it could be I have AJ. AJ, go ahead. And, and yeah. You mentioned a special issue on abolitionism. Has that already happened? Is that about to happen? That has already happened. I think I want to say it's December 2018, but Greg? Okay. That sounds right to me. I don't have our, uh, it was not while we were uh, editors. Okay, um, yes, Manisha uh, uh, guest edited that, if I recall okay. correctly. Any, yeah, and I guess one question that kind of arises from that, if there's been a special issue recently, would you discourage someone from sending an article on that topic if they have one for just a regular issue? No, not as a standalone article. Um, you know, I think obviously one would reach a saturation point of special issues on a topic until there's a feeling that there's something really vital and broad and new to say, but in terms of individual work, absolutely. Don't see you, Yeah, Lindsay, go ahead. Why not? Um, thank you, guys. Uh, this feedback has been uh, awesome. Um, can you hear me? Yep. Great. Uh, one of the questions I was thinking about is um, you're talking about this process of like revising, resubmitting, and sometimes after you get that reader report feedback, um, the article is rejected, right? Um, how sufficiently different does an article need to be to maybe send back to the journal? For example, maybe I wrote an article and it was rejected and then I kind of focused on like 20% of that and blew up that 20% portion into a whole new article. Is that something I could resubmit or how does that work? I don't know. I think that's a little bit of a gray area, but I think you could resubmit it, especially if you wrote a really good cover letter, you know, explaining you know, you've seen part of this before, but let me tell you how this is actually a totally different article. Um, I think we'd consider it. I mean, and by the way, somebody uh, brought up the question of cover letters and their question. So the original initial cover letter that you send when you first submit your article, you really don't have to agonize over that. This really does not matter very much. Uh, we're just gonna ask you to send a cover letter that could be just something really brief, like, hi, I'm, you know, so-and-so, I'm sending in my article. I mean, it's really, we're just gonna take that right off, off of your article and make a decision about your article. Um, so where the cover letter matters, again, is like if you've revised and resubmitted, you wanna send a letter explaining what you've done and how you think you've answered the most significant critiques and anything that you didn't answer. Or in the case that Lindsay just said, if you're, if you're sort of like, going back to something that was similar to something that we've already seen, but you think it's very, very different. Yeah, tell, explain that to us. And you know, 
we're people here, right? So like you can imagine that you're sending it to human beings who are very interested in this field and want to know what you have to say and why you think it's important. Clayton, did you wanna ask a question? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks. Uh, thanks to everybody involved uh, thus far. Uh, my, my question kind of picks up on that last one and is sort of about um, the number of sort of back and forths you, you might expect to have in a revise and resubmit. If you get a revise and resubmit, obviously, you know, it was mentioned, you know, you're really hoping to hear back, but maybe that revise and resubmit that you, you send back doesn't quite meet, you know, what the editors had been looking for. How many sort of you know, how do you know when you're when you're you, you've reached a, a nice sort of c common ground there and like and sort of I guess my question is, you know, how much time, how many times do you think is, is sort of worth it? How do you know when you're never going to see eye to eye on on on, you know, what you're submitting and what the editors are, you know, imagining the article could be? Does that make sense? A good question. So I think the, you know, I would guess that the average piece that goes out, goes into the journal has both a revisory submit um, and then one more round, you know, does that revision and has one more round after that, uh, possibly back to a reader, often not, but still where we are like this revision fulfills these parts and here's another. Um, and, um, you know, and there are some that are obviously uh, more than that. Our job as an editor is if it's not happening to say, to say that and nobody likes, uh, you know, being, especially if you're into that, into the process, nobody enjoys that aspect. Uh, you know, my own students have had that where they've been doing revisions and had an editor and say, I just don't think this is ever going to, you know, that, that what you said, you know, this meeting is ever going to happen. Uh, and that feels terrible to receive. Um, but if the editor believes that, it's our job to tell you that, right? You know, we, we try and take your time really seriously, right? That's why we want you to know quickly if it's going out to readers or not. And we don't want to be, you know, leading anybody buddy, on. Um, you know, the question from your end, if an editor is not telling you to go away, then you should assume they mean it sincerely. Your own decision about what's the degree of uh, kind of grind you're willing to go through, you know, obviously depends on what you're looking for from, right? Um, you know, and, and, and what you're hearing, you know, clearly in, in response. What do you want to add to that, Kate? I want to emphasize something that you said earlier, which is that we do want you to take the revision really seriously. And um, somebody asked, you know, like, how do I know, like basically the question of like, I don't want to sacrifice my principles to meet the demands of these editors. Like you should never do that, right? So if you think that you're being asked to do something with your work that you don't believe in, or you don't want to go that direction with your work, like don't, it's your work and you can take it to another journal. I mean, another piece of advice that I got in grad school was like, if you get rejected, just turn it around and send it somewhere else. Um, there are other journals, and so um, don't don't only do what you think is helpful and enhances your work. And that's also our goal is to push authors to bring out what we think are the most interesting and important aspects of your work. Um, but we don't want to read a mildly revised uh, version. If you think of it like an undergrad where, you know, like you're teaching undergrads and you say like, could you, you know, you need to fix this in the following ways, but they just go through and like fix all the little things you circled, you know, like all the little line edits, but they don't really revise, right? It's like, that is not what we're looking for. So I would say another piece of, another sort of piece of advice you might want to follow is that when you do the revise and resubmit, do show it all uh, to somebody, whether it's another student or uh, you know colleague, and say and and kind of get feedback on does this person think that you answered the reviews? That's another. I mean, we are not we're the least good at judging our own work, right? So you might think you really nailed it this time, but actually somebody else reading it is like, no, no, like I don't even understand this. Um, so I think like another part, way to partly answer Clayton's question is that. When we see like a where you really revised in good faith, you know, and you sort of brought it back and said, look, here are the ways I answered it. And we say, well, yeah, not totally, but like, let's keep trying. That we feel better about seeing that than someone who turned it around fast and kind of didn't go deep on rethinking the things that we asked them to rethink, if that makes sense. So yeah, there's not a hard and fast answer to that question, but I do think, um, you know, we're definitely looking for people to take the process seriously. 
And one other thing is that we both, one of the goals that we talked about for the journal is just um, encouraging good writing. Um, and we both care about really good, clear writing that's reasonably jargon free, et cetera. And so uh, we may also, you know, take advantage of our position as editors to encourage you to not only revise in terms of content and uh, historiography, but also to think about your writing. And we may ask you to, um, you know, do certain things that have to do with making things clearer, uh, you know, usual things having to do with active voice, topic sentences of paragraphs. We want to see the argument running through the entire article, not just, you know, don't make an argument at the beginning and have the rest be descriptive. Um, and so these are things that we're also going to, you know, take an interest in. So it's not just, you know, are you saying something interesting, but also how are you presenting your argument? And is it going to, sh are you showing people, you know, how this really works? Are there more, Clayton and Bruce, are there more um, questions from folks? Melissa, did you have one or you just, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I wasn't sure which emoji to use. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm going to present y'all with not a hard question necessarily, but maybe hard to answer question. Um, if y'all could speak any more and maybe more specifically within like Civil War era kind of insular topics, which you did turn things around for not a good fit for us. Um, I mean, again, the obvious like uh, the writing or like maybe it's too historiographically presented or things like that. But I mean, we, we know what's good and what's in the journal. But honestly, I mean, in a way that you're not exposing someone or anything like that, like what have you recently felt is not a good fit, maybe substance wise that we could learn from? I mean, good writing is not, I mean, <laughs> so yeah, specific as you can without feeling like you're being too, uh, I don't know, gossipy or something. That's a good question. I don't want to quite answer it because I would really not want anyone to feel like uh, we're talking about, uh, about, about them. Um, but I, I can give you a certain set of categories, right? One of which is the article with a really interesting intervention that starts to dissolve upon contact, right? You know, and, and you know that we definitely get examples of this. Um, where it's very clear they have something really bold to say, uh, but the readers, you know, we're going to send to readers who really know their stuff uh, and, you know, uh, you know, so to say, oh, you know, this, 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 uh, you know, is this really, what would be the, what would it take uh, to make this kind of case? We don't look for readers who say, I disagree, therefore, you know, that's not, it's not a policing of opinion, um, but a question of persuasion. Uh, right, it's a communicative act, and if you're not able to persuade people that there's something there, that's really important uh, information to take from a reader's report and, you know, meaningful for us. Another category is sort of the, the sibling of that, which is uh, lots of evidence and not a clear statement of significance, right? You know, somebody who's really studied something well and really knows it, but hasn't been able to tell us uh, this is why it matters. I don't mean so much make a case about the Civil War era, but even really why it matters at all. And so there are, you know, also examples of really significant dogged research where they take, the writers take for granted why it's important. Um, and uh, you never want to do that. Uh, one of the things I think that's exciting in the thing like the Civil War era is any, you can make a case for lots of things being important, and there's nothing that we have to run. Right. There's nothing that we want coming in saying, well, duh, everybody knows blank is, you know, got to be important to everybody in it. We're a big, broad, you know, open minded, you know, field. And you've got to make your case, even if you're doing something that seems to sit right at the middle of the field. Um, and you've got to make that case if you're if you're doing something, no matter what you're doing, you've got to make that case on, on the significance. So those are sort of two categories. Kate, do you have other stuff you're comfortable saying in response to this? I mean, I think those two categories actually do a good job of, you know, sort of like oh, the big claim with not very much evidence and then lots of evidence, but not a big claim, I think are two common problem, very common problems. Um, yeah, and I, I think, you know, just to reiterate what Greg said, I mean, I can't really underscore enough how openly we see this field um, and so, 
And that goes for everything that from things that would be considered conventional to the field, like Civil War military history, to things that would be considered pretty unconventional to the field. Um, I'm not going to give an example because there are a lot of them, but you know, just sort of like you name it. Um, so what we want you to do is just tell us how to connect with what you're doing. And it doesn't even have to, again, it doesn't have to connect to the Civil War, but just, you know, and we have a big enough stable of readers. Mm -hmm. And we ourselves are broadly interested in a lot of things that we will be able, we have confidence that we'll be able to get a good assessment of your article, whatever it is about, if you can make the case to us that it's important and that you've done your do 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 due diligence, you've done the research. So yeah, yeah. So it, We could take maybe one more question and then kind of sign off. And I have a, a something to throw out to everybody at the at the very oh, yeah. end. Um, but if there's one, yeah. So um, that is this that uh, Kate and I have also talked about. You know, if this format seems viable of using a format like this for something uh, like a, a book talk to have. You know, I mean, generally somewhere is quiet for these things because people are traveling to archives and and in many places. Uh, um, you know, that's not not the case right now. Um, and also, uh, and so, you know, also there's this whole crop of books that have come out that have been in some ways uh, overwhelmed by, uh, by the by events um, of thinking about some sort of, of moderated book talk, uh, not meant as a straightforward lecture, which I personally, you know, uh, find challenging to, to absorb. Um, but as a conversation and a conversation that would include some space for, for question and answer. Um, and just so two pieces, A, if you're, you know, if you're interested in that, you know, to kind of get a sense of if people are interested in that. Um, and B, if you have uh, ideas of books that are out there that may not be on our, our radar, I would certainly be happy to, to get a quick, you don't have to give a big, long explanation, but just a quick email, uh, you know, what about blank, what about blank. Uh, we're still trying to figure out how to do this in a way that doesn't feed into people's Zoom exhaustion but does allow us to utilize these things. We hoped uh, to be doing this at the society meeting, you know, a week ago in Raleigh, and we're not. Uh, in some ways, this allows us to reach more people. In other ways, of course, it makes the interpersonal engagement even harder. And uh, we're trying to assess going forward, uh, you know, how we can take advantage of it while recognizing the limits of it. Yeah, maybe since the, um, I mean, I wanted to say this anyway, but since this, the chat is not activated, we could just leave it that, I mean, you all know where to find us, right? We have our email address mm -hmm. there readily available out there, but just, you know, so basically what we're asking is for your, any suggestions that you have on specific books that have come out recently that we could highlight on a Zoom book talk this summer, and also just other ways that we can serve the profession in general or things that you're interested in that we can do, particularly in this weird climate of pandemic, um, to help you think about your careers or publishing in the journal or scholarship or what have you. Um, we're really interested to know uh, your suggestions and ideas for that. So email, so I think at this point, the best way to kind of communicate that is email us and uh, we'll get back to you. And we're, we're really happy to be in touch with you guys. We're just delighted that you're all here now and hope this session has been um, helpful for you. And also if there were particular questions that you had that didn't get answered here, also feel free to just send us a note um, personally and we can answer those directly. Okay. And I just want to, again, thank Cecily. You did so much to make this happen and I think it worked out really well. So thank you. Thank you, Cecily. And submit. And, yeah. And submit yeah. your article. <laughs> we get a lot, which is great, but we're always excited when something new comes up. And I'll share the full list of uh, folks who joined us today with the editors so that they can sort of in perpetuity have a copy of your names and emails, <laughs> uh, so that, you know, if someone out of the blue, if you, if you know, if you want to email the editors and say, I was on this chat, they'll have the, the list of purchase. Well, that's true. <laughs> thank you so much, all of you all. And uh, thank you so much, Cecily. This, you, did, you were exceptional. Bye, everybody. No problem. Thanks, everyone. All right.